Hello everyone, whether it's late in the night or early morning and you have a full day ahead or you manage to find a gap in your afternoon schedule to join us, we are happy to welcome you to our fourth Women in GI webinar supported by the World Gastroenterology Organization. I'm convinced that today we will offer you an inclusive and supportive discussion and we deeply hope that the messages provided from our today's panelists will support you uh, as women in gastroenterology all around the world. I am Georgiana Gulka Blanario. I am an assistant professor of gastroenterology at Grigore de Popa University of Medicine and Pharmacy in Yash, Romania, and gastroenterologist at San Spiridon County Clinical Emergency Hospital in Yash, Romania. I am truly thankful to WGO for offering such a strong platform for, for both the involvement and the advancement of women in gastroenterology and for their commitment to building a cohesive community which fosters dedicated activities in this regard. I am grateful to be your moderator today when we have such inspiring female leaders paving the way for women in gastroenterology. Therefore, I am happy to welcome our panelists today Dr. Nazish Bhatt, Head of Gastroenterology Department and Associate Professor of Gastroenterology at China Sindh Medical Center, Karachi, Pakistan. Dr. Mashiko Sitsidi, Professor of Gastroenterology and Head of the Gastroenterology Department at the University of Cape Town, South Africa. Dr. Rim Sharaya, Associate Professor of Gastroenterology and Director of Interventional Endoscopy at New York Presbyterian Hospital, United States and Dr. Leticia Moreira, gastroenterologist at Clinic Hospital of Barcelona, Spain. Moreover, it is my pleasure to welcome our male ally joining us today, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Metz, Professor of Medicine and Dean of Medical School at the University of Melbourne, Australia, former president of the Royal Austral Asian College of Physicians and incoming president of WGO. As you might be already familiar with from the previous uh, Women in GI webinars, this is a conversational webinar, and we invite you to utilize the Q&A box to address either questions or comments throughout all the session. Now, I am inviting our first panelist today, Dr. Nazir Bhatt, Associate Professor of Gastroenterology at China Postgraduate Medical Center, Karachi, Pakistan, to share her thoughts with us. Please, Dr. Nazir. Uh, greetings from Pakistan. Thanks, Georgiana, for a very nice introduction. So today I'm going to talk about a very important topic which we female doctors, nurses, and healthcare workers are facing every day is professional harassment. So what is this professional harassment or workplace harassment? So workplace harassment can also be referred to as professional maltreatment or bullying, and it occurs when an employee is harassed by another employee particularly because of race, faith, gender, nationality, age, disability, or sexual orientation. It embraces any unwelcome behavior towards another person in the workplace and is in contradiction of the law in all conditions. This is a very important point. Next, please. Harassment of female healthcare workers. So uh, in Pakistan and in worldwide, nurses, female doctors, residents are susceptible to workplace harassment. It leads to depression, impaired personal and professional life, and poor career development. Next, please. So I'm sharing you a study, uh, the study done in Pakistan in one of the largest tertiary care private hospital, workplace mistreatment and mental health in female surgeons in Pakistan and basically this study includes all the 146 women residents which are working in the um, surgery department and other departments and what they have the study concluded workplace mistreatment in particularly harassment and bullying it's very common um, uh, has a damaging impact on the mental well-being of female surgeons particularly trainees the absence of support groups in Pakistan should be urgently addressed so that surgeons, especially trainees, may cope better with potentially harmful workplace stressor. So in Pakistan, and I think uh, in especially in the Asian countries, there is a concept that uh, females are uh, incapable of performing like uh, heavy physical work, like, like surgeries, like interventions, or like in gastroenterology, they cannot do ERCPs and other advanced interventions as well. 
so this is a common concept in uh, uh, in here in our countries and they this leads to the bullying of the young doctors and the female doctors and it's very common so this is a slide which is i'm sharing with you this is a news which was published in one of the a newspaper of pakistan senior female doctor facing harassment discrimination at major karachi public hospital so this news is regarding me and uh, it, it 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 mentioned that female gastroenterologists facing harassment on ethnic and gender grounds at karachi hospital and at that time the people forced me to quit my job so and uh, they blackmailed me for several months Uh, regard on the basis of my gender and ethnicity and all the things, but I have faced and passed uh, uh, this time with with a good teamwork, and I know my uh, how to save me and what are the system where where should I report. So these are the things which which save me at that time. Next, please. So this. Uh, twitter post i am sharing regarding a doctor which which want to help uh, the patients during the period of covid and she faced that people considered female doctors as a object of just for the friendship or the fix and she quit telemedicine because just of this behavior so this is very common people don't take female doctor seriously next please so how to manage this is a very important question in healthcare threatening situations can come from patients peers and superiors team work is the best policy creating alliances among female coworkers and encouraging superiors to intervene and act as mediators for those affected are beneficial practices commitment to a harassment free workplace should be a part of an overall diversity and inclusion strategy and there should be a zero tolerance uh, policies in the institution regarding the female harassment thank you i think this is my last slide dr nazish thank you so much for the strength of sharing this personal experience and for the extremely powerful message you have delivered it's extremely impressive especially to see uh, this in the context in the context of the burden of harassment at the workplace uh, which you are currently facing uh, could you please mention what is the most frequent form of gender harassment uh, basically the most common type of sexual harassment is the hostile uh, workplace environment in which the the supervisors or the colleagues do bullying and uh, there is a discrimination um, in the institutes towards their female colleagues so this is the main i think and i uh, we are suffering from this is the main uh, type of harassment we are facing discrimination and hostile work environment uh do you think there are methods readily available to prevent harassment in the workplace in the environment um, you are currently talking about in pakistan and in uh, the south asian countries i think we are lacking such policies there should be a zero tolerance policies by the institutes where female you know that most of the doctors currently now are female so there should be a zero tolerance policies and there should be some uh, support groups female doctors uh, support groups which help each other uh, in coping this type of situation then the the very important thing that one should know what to do when such thing happen there should be some reporting system in the institute and there is also some uh, like training uh, workshops regarding to the female colleagues and also the male colleagues to how to cope harassment and how to report harassment in your institutes yeah definitely having the institutional support is essential in this matter Professor yeah. Metz, based on your institutional experience, would you please share the approach in the academic environment in relation with workplace harassment? Thanks very much, Georgian, and that was a, a great talk, Nazish. Thank you very much. I, I, I guess the additional point that I would raise, I think your points are all really important, but an additional point is that we should get the message across very early in people's development. Uh, in my institution. Um, as dean i've given the initial lectures to the first year students 
uh, right at the start of their clinical career. And in one of those talks, I talk about professionalism and in professionalism, I talk about zero tolerance of sexual harassment, zero tolerance of, of, of racial harassment or discrimination. And they get the message that we're not going to tolerate it. They, they'll be out. They, they won't be involved. Now, uh, it, I'm not saying Australia is perfect, but I think we have probably a better track record than the countries you've mentioned, really because early education is important. And those who would want to discriminate are on notice. They can't do it. It's against uh, the law, but it's also against the principles of our institution, the university, the hospital, and their colleagues. Um, so there are still some older people. I'm young, you see. There are still some older people uh, who may not have grown up in that generation of being uh, uh, prevented to have those attitudes, but they're gradually uh, losing their positions. They're gradually retiring. And, and, and the younger people do understand when they're educated well from the start. Thank you for this uh, positive uh, and optimistic message, Professor Metz. And now uh, transitioning from the strong and uh, troublesome subject, which unfortunately still brings a high burden to female gastroenterologists, to a more optimistic approach and focus on authentic leadership, among women. Uh, it is my pleasure to invite our next panelist today, uh, Dr. Mashiko Sitsidi from Cape Town, South Africa, for the next presentation. Uh, thank you, Georgina. And uh, good afternoon from sunny South Africa to all the participants. And I'd like to thank the WGO for this wonderful opportunity to present uh, in this Women in GI series. I'm really um, honored. honored. So what I wanted to talk about uh, was authentic leadership by especially women. And the reason I chose this topic and it's close to my heart is because a few years ago, I was going to give a presentation at a very important meeting and I had planned to wear a sleeveless dress. And quite strangely, I found myself wondering whether the sleeveless attire would be seen as professional. And I quickly remembered that in March, 2009, the first lady, Michelle Obama, had received a lot of negative uh, media because she had decided to wear a sleeveless dress to uh, Obama's first presidential address to Congress. Also, if you uh, Google professional attire for women, what you see will be the picture uh, in the middle of a woman wearing a black suit. But my question is, what if your personality and personal style is more reflected in the output on the right-hand side? So that led me to think about how we are socialized as women and how that influence what we think, what we believe, what we say and how we act. And I think these sorts of things can result in self-doubt, the imposter syndrome, and this need to prove ourselves over and over again. And so what I want to do is to briefly take you through how we can become more and more of ourselves in the workplace, or put simply, how we can lead authentically. So what does that mean? And even before I looked up the formal definition, my definition was we needed to be true to ourselves while feeling, conf feeling confident and comfortable in that and not worrying about what is quote unquote expected and still achieve all of our professional goals. The formal definition, however, if you look it up, says that this is a healthy alignment between your values and behaviors that can re-energize life. And this is all aspects of life, professional and personal. And we all know that this is important because trying to be somebody that you're not. In other words, inauthenticity is exhausting, it's counterproductive, and it creates inner conflict. So the question really is how do we achieve authentic leadership? And really there are four steps that are suggested. The first would be to stop and take stock. What that means is that it's about increasing your self-awareness. Who are you? What do you stand for? What are your values? What are your strengths, weaknesses? What are your likes and dislikes? You need to really sit down and think about this. Once that is done, the next step would be to assess the status quo and to see whether it aligns with how you're behaving. And then you need to set goals to say, this is what I believe, this is who I believe I am. Is my daily routine or my practice reflective of that? And then set goals as to how you're going to slowly begin to change this. The third step would be then to take action. This can be quite intimidating because it requires you to be courageous, to be disciplined, 
um, to communicate these changes so that the others that work with you can actually start to respect that. And it might mean that you need to take baby steps to start with and not do a complete overhaul of your lifestyle overnight, but then to take the time to gradually ensure that what you say you are, who you say you are, starts to align gradually with the behaviors that you are displaying. So it may mean looking at the things that you're doing, what do you need to cut back on so that you can get more of what you want and, and things like that. And then finally, this process is really, as I say, quite a, a vulnerable process. You need to be able to get support, not just from your uh, mentors and your uh, coaches, but also from your colleagues, your friends that you trust, as well as your family. And so what I'd like to bring home really is to suggest to you that authentic leadership is non-negotiable. We are all unique. We have special talents that we can bring to the party and there's no need to be anyone else other than who we are and who we are meant to be. As far as I'm concerned, it is like oxygen. It represents life itself. And I feel that we, particularly women, have to determine and set our own standards. I always say that if we had not done this, if you remember that in the old days, women were not allowed to go to university. And so none of us would be here if we maintain the status quo of the old standards. Authentic leadership is associated with increased productivity, fulfillment, and therefore success. And there is plenty of data to show this. It is in fact not a personality trait, neither is it static. It is something that is adaptable to every situation. Therefore, it is never perfect, nor done. It's a work in process and it's a continuous challenge. And one can be mindful of this and take the steps as is required as one progresses to get closer and closer to aligning what you believe and how you behave and what you put out there. As I've suggested, it requires a fair amount of honesty, vulnerability and transparency, as well as communication. And so I'd like to encourage all of us to take a leave from Michelle Obama's book to go boldly ahead and be our true selves. Thank you for that opportunity and I'm happy to take any questions. Dr. Mashiko, thank you for this inspiration presentation on authentic leadership, especially by women. I really like that, <laughs> what you put it on in parentheses. And for uh, stressing the role of self-awareness when we talk about building our self-confidence. Uh, I definitely agree that it is essential to be true to oneself to be authentic, to keep being authentic no matter what, and to follow personal beliefs. Uh, I also found it very important that you underline something related to taking action, which sometimes means taking baby steps. And baby steps are still steps and are important in paving this way. Um, do you believe that when we talk about leading authentically, uh, this could also involve a higher degree of focusing on personal targets and that this might bring along a risk for the leader to be perceived as selfish? Thanks, Georgina. I think that's an excellent question. It is true that others might perceive this sort of thing as being selfish, but actually it is not true. It's actually paradoxical because I think when you're authentic, firstly, you mean what you say and you say what you mean. And by so doing, you can be trusted by your colleagues. Number two is that because you're empathic to yourself, you also tend to be empathic to other people. Now that means that you celebrate their strengths, you know, and you can guide them in areas where they need to be improved. So they feel heard and appreciated and valued. This encourages trusting relationships between yourself and your colleagues and the people that you lead. And therefore, actually the situation in the workplace, in the institution, for the colleagues, for yourselves improves and people who feel respected who feel like that they're being heard and understood will work hard. They'll be you know, pushed to achieve the same goals that we are all trying to achieve. So I think actually, and there is evidence to show that this can only promote trust and um, uh, relationships and, and, and those things are good for any institution. Thank you. Since we have so great female leaders here, I would like to hear from your experiences. What are the challenges to leading authentically? Um, Georgina, I've suggested that it is risky to change the way you've been and the way you want to be. People are used to how things were. Some people, even those that you trust, might prefer you to behave in the way that you did before. Because of course, a change might imply a change for them too. But you need to trust your instincts. 
It, it requires you to be disciplined. You do need to be vulnerable. All of these things are threatening. Sometimes in a professional space, you know, you don't want to be seen as emotional or et cetera. All of which are misconceptions, by the way. But, and so you need to be courageous and, and, and that can be difficult to do. You need to communicate this to, to the people that you work with. And that is not always easy. So it is a challenging process, but I think it is important and it is key. And I think if you manage the process, the end goal can only be positive, as I've said, for, for everyone involved. And you also free others to be more of who they are. And I think if we are all showing up in the workplace as who we truly are, as I say, with all the talents that we have and all the gifts and skills, um, we can only do better in this case for our patients, uh, for the students uh, that we, we teach, et cetera. Definitely agree with that. And uh, in addition to developing our leadership abilities in the process of our professional growth, it is also important to learn to be proactive and also to develop our negotiation skills. And uh, this brings us to the next presentation of today's webinar, which will be delivered by Dr. Rim Sharaya, Associate Professor of Gastroenterology and Director of Interventional Endoscopy at New York Presbyterian Hospital, the United States. Dr. Thank Rim, you. the floor is yours. Thanks. It's, uh, um, it's an honor as well to be here. So I thought I would... Um, I would also talk about um, negotiation as well as promotion, because I think they go hand in hand. Um, uh, when we think about negotiation, it often comes from a place of uh, feeling uncomfortable and uh, feeling that um, uh, feeling that you are not fully aware of where what talents you have and where you need to go, and. Um, preparing for that conversation is, is very important. It's often important to sort of negotiate with all aspects of life, but uh, you can negotiate from either being authorship to even um, negotiating um, for a salary, for a job description, uh, for anything uh, that you often want to have. And one of the factors uh, that usually are affected in the in the states is that you can negotiate for salary. It's not often the same case um, in everywhere. Um, but uh, for instance, with me, I was uncomfortable asking for what I wanted and I had to go in uh, prepared for what I needed to um, uh, to ask for. So for instance, um, I spoke to one of my male allies who sort of uh, gave me a book called Why Women Don't Ask. And in that book, the, one of the first chapters um, that we, uh, th that sort of explains is that if both a man and a woman start at $100, they get offered a job and they get offered $100 um, salary. Um, the man asks for 120, the woman asks for 105, and they get 102 and 110. There's already a disparity in salary. And uh, what then happens when you go for your next job or your next promotion is that the 110 becomes 200, the 102 becomes 110. And so that salary gaps uh, increases throughout your life. So it's always important to make sure you ask for it. Know your worth do your research, it's really important that uh, you understand what you're asking for. Um, so um, the most important power you have with negotiation is the ability to walk away. And a sort of very simple example of that is that if you're negotiating uh, um, uh, for a new job, um, you don't necessarily need to get it um, and you can just walk away and keep the, the current job that you have. You can negotiate for a position, authorship, leadership. Can I have the next slide, please? And so this is the book that I recommend um, everyone to read. They've gone to different iterations of it. It's sort of a very nice example of, of different things. It's not necessarily related to medicine, um, but it's important um, to have that. So you need to have uh, buy-in from the other side. You need to understand what the other side wants. And the reason for that is that sometimes you think you're negotiating for the same thing. And one example for that is um, an ugly orange example where they 
both parties wanted the orange, but then you find out that one wanted the peel and one wanted the pulp. And so if you have a conversational uh, style between people, um, you, can, uh, you can get to what you need. Uh, next slide, please. So when we talk about promotion, um, that's something that you need to uh, maybe think of your authentic leadership style, as we heard, and sort of look at aspects in your organization, at work, or even within societies, what, uh, what, where you can um, be exposed into leadership opportunities and what, um, what you can uh, do to nominate yourself. You need to understand the criteria. And for most parts, we often fulfill the criteria, but don't think that we have the ability to lead. And so that comes into the talk we just heard about understanding what you're worth, what your value is, and don't be afraid to ask. So you can use that for a promotion, um, for uh, salaries, for promotion from an associate to professorship, um, promotion um, into leadership within the organization. So just understand if you don't ask, you'll never get. You need to believe in your ability, um, do your research and uh, be prepared. Uh, thank you very much. Dr. Reem, thank you for offering us this practical framework for developing our negotiation abilities and for highlighting the importance of taking action. Uh, I completely agree that self-confidence results in the strength of uh, standing up for ourselves and to know our worth, uh, including this uh, setting of discussing uh, both promotion and in settings of negotiations. What are the challenges you've faced when... Uh, in the context of discussing promotion, for example? Um, so I think the best example is to learn um, from, uh, from other people and to sort of understand the criteria. So for, for me, for instance, I wanted to go from assistant to associate. And in the handbook at our uh, university, there's sort of certain guidelines that you need for promotion. And I thought I fulfilled all those criteria. We had an interim chief at the time. I had my annual meeting and I said, I think I should go up for promotion. And he was like, no, you're not ready. And then the next year we had a different chief and nothing had changed within my criteria except just being a little bit more, more one year sort of into that, but same, same everything. And he just went to me, first thing he said is like, I don't understand why you didn't apply for your promotion last year. Um, you fulfilled everything that you needed. And sort of it set me, it gave, gave me pause to sort of think that if, if I had done a little bit more negotiating or a little bit more understanding where he was coming from and I would have said actually I do have all the criteria it's x y and z and here it is and I've learned to come into meetings um, you know when you send your cv you assume people read it but really no one does no one reads emails they get 10 hundred emails a, a, a day so now I go into a meeting with my CV and people like flick through it as we're talking so I, I know and it's it's fair I do the same thing um, but it's it's important to sort of have that in mind um, the other thing is to just apply yourself for all these awards I, I often see that men put themselves up um, for these awards. Um, there was a, a, an award that was happening at uh, Cornell about female mentorship. And one of um, my uh, colleagues said, will you nominate me? Here's my CV, here's the award, here I fulfilled everything. And I thought that was interesting. I would have never put myself up for that. Um, but now within a group of, of, uh, of GIs here in the US, we've all decided to each nominate a female partner um, every year for whatever criteria, whatever award, because there's so many um, that it's always good to have that visibility, um, which ties in with, you know, sort of the, the syndrome that we all have of uh, whether we're worthy or not. Um, and I think we all have the opportunity and we just need to sort of grab it. Thank you. Any other thoughts or wanting to share some experiences, please, Dr. Nazish? 
what i have observed that usually female doctors are afraid of asking for promotion and high salaries because they think if they ask they uh, so they, they will be fired from the institute or uh, everybody in, ignore uh, your promotion or your uh, like your whatever you you ask for so usually female are afraid of asking so i actually have a a, a great story for that you always have to have a backup plan, right? Especially if you're a asking for more salary, because the the key thing that I always tell people is that the 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 worst answer is they're going to say no. Um, so always do your research, understanding what other people are getting paid. Um, for instance, and I I often like I've asked from for help from my husband who he's in finance, so his job is always about negotiation. So it's always good to get that perspective. But for one of the bigger negotiations that I did for my job is I actually went to speak to someone who's good at negotiations and she gave me three key points to say. Um, and, and I had a sort of a book with me and I had those points in there. And I said, I want this because X, Y, and Z. And I kept repeating it because she kept saying, just repeat it, just repeat it and just pretend you're writing notes. But all <laughs> I had was what to say in there. And um, they initially said no. So I closed my book and I said, thank you very much for the opportunity. I think I'm going to look elsewhere. And I walked out and I, I remember like walking out and my heart was beating and I was like, oh, my God, I just, you know, ruined this opportunity. And then my chief followed me downstairs to the like to the streets and said, don't leave, I think we can work something out. And I was like, oh my God, this actually works. <laughs> and, um, and you know, ultimately a week later or two weeks later, I, I heard back with exactly what I wanted. And it, it doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes you have to meet in the middle, but I knew at that point I was very severely underpaid at, that they could offer me what I wanted. And, and I think that goes into know what you want, know the research because it's always out there and ask other people because they'll share some other stories with you but i i completely agree you you're often like nervous and and you don't want to upset them because you think but they'll do the same thing um and i've often had had that conversation with other other people both males and females who'll tell me just ask for it mm. that's such a great story dr mashiko do you want to share something no, no, I completely agree with what she said. And I think um, when you recognize fear, whether it's to ask to go and be at the ballet of your child or whatever. In fact, I think that's the moment to stop and say, but what's the worst that can happen? And you often see that when you ask, actually you are granted that thing because it's not unreasonable to expect that you can work and also be there for your family as and when you need to. So I think it's the idea of being conscious of the fear and pushing through it anyway. Because if you don't ask, you will never know what the answer may have been. I, I totally agree. And this power of being able to walk away, it's a power of yourself. I don't think it's something which def necessarily has an influence on the others. But assuming that you are able to walk away in such a situation and to to make your choice, yeah, that you're more, you're worthier than what's being offered to you. I think that is a very important step on the long term into to building up your self-confidence and self-awareness. Thank you, Dr. Reem, for, uh, for your talk again and for all the tips, very practical in an organized framework. And now we'll go on to discussing another step, which is uh, important in the process of professional growth, uh, and is represented by both mentorship and sponsorship, uh, both playing very important roles, along with networking. Uh, we will get some great tips, I'm sure, about that from uh, our next panelist, Dr. Leticia Moreiro from Barcelona, Spain. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Georgina, for the introduction and uh, thank you for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, so I want to start the talk uh, with this phrase, talent is distributed equally, opportunities are not. And this uh, highlights the importance of mentorship, sponsorship and networking. And we will discuss this uh, in the few next slides. 
Uh, starting with mentorship, we need mentors. We need mentors. Um, uh, there is a lack of uh, mentors uh, in GI, especially uh, uh, mentors that could tutorize women in GI. And we need this because uh, role modeling is important to attract young people, especially GI, um, women, uh, uh, young GIs. And as you can see here in the, um, in the, in the graph uh, from a study published like around two years ago, 44% of women experience difficulty finding a mentor in comparison of 16% of, of men. So there is a difference uh, here and this lack of, uh, uh, of mentorship for women um, leads to a several like um, problems or, uh, in regarding the, the, uh, our uh, development uh, our, in, in our career in, in several aspects. And can you, uh, next slide please. And here I can, I, I want only to show you an example of these um, uh, bad consequences, no? Uh, with this study uh, regarding gender differences in the authorship of global major gastroenterology society guidelines um, during the last 20 years. And you can see in the, in the last line, the summary where uh, you can see that regarding women, only 15% were uh, women first authors and 15% women senior authors in these guidelines in the last period of time. So we need to change that. And uh, so now no, we know that mentor, mentorship is important, but probably even is more important sponsorship. And what is that? It is um, actively advocating for an individual to fill a particular role. It means that a, a sponsors need to identify um, people with a, a specific talent, a hard workers, and a, help them with opportunities, help them with a, a promotion and a career advancement. A, next slide, please. We know that women a, have fewer specific opportunities regarding writing a literal, being part of a national committee, uh, etc. So um, sponsors are, are needed, specifically sponsors committed to gender diversity because uh, um, so if you are a potential sponsor, uh, please think not only in men, but also and especially in these days in women, we need you to sponsor us. And in the other side, if you need a sponsor, uh, um, please uh, work for that. And how can I um, identify my sponsor and how a potential sponsor have, uh, can uh, identify a, a person to, to help? So uh, this leads to the next slide, um, please, uh, to the last point that is networking. Um, networking is, is a key part of our um, promotion, our uh, negotiation, and I encourage you uh, as GI woman to network and strengthen uh, your voices. Uh, networking not only with women but also with men uh, um, to collaborate, to um, uh, help them, help uh, each other, to advise. And in this sense, in the last few years, uh, several um, uh, organizations are supporting this networking, like uh, Women in GI for the UAG, uh, WGO, like this kind of, of, of activities. Uh, also, AGA with uh, its task force. Uh, next slide, please. So in summary, um, uh, regarding role of associations and institutions to highlight or to promote these uh, three key points in, in, in our career. Uh, I suggest that associations uh, organize workshops to promote and reinforce skills, supporting programs, mentoring programs, uh, promotion processes, favor networking, ensure female participation in all the activities, and besides the role of associations, our role as GI community, um, key points, mentorship of junior GI woman by senior GI, 
not only women, but also men, senior GIs, promote GI women, sponsor them because role model is important. We can do it and we can and we need uh, to see that we can do it. So, and also please participate in activities to favor networking, to access and give access to those opportunities. And don't be shy, as uh, Rim already said us, don't be shy. Remember that talent is distributed equally opportunities are not. So look for them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Moreira, for pointing out the importance of both mentorship, but especially sponsorship in uh, our professional growth. And also that networking is a great tip into achieving that. Uh, do you think it would be effective to find sponsors also outside your department or would it be more difficult? No, no, I, I believe it's it's uh, it's important to find sponsors outside our our institution. The, the easy problem, the, the easiest way is in, in, in people around us, but um, sponsors um, outside our institution is, is a key part. And uh, so I, I recommend you that if uh, first um, we need to know what we want to do. And what uh, what is our um, goal, no? And then uh, uh, search for people that uh, um, are leader in leaders in that, and 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 look for that, and and don't be shy, and and get contact in contact with them, uh, and uh, and that is the key of networking because maybe you don't know how to contact them, but uh, you know one person that could can help you, blah blah blah, no. So uh, this is really important and uh, is part of, of, of the problem that we have and we just discussed in, uh, in, the, in the previous um, uh, talk with, with uh, negotiation. No? Here is also the same. We are shy and, and we don't have to be shy. So we, we, we need to be self-confident and, and, and took and, and say, hello, here, here I am and, and I can do it. Please uh, help me. Thank you. Now that we have got some practical tips on uh, how to identify sponsors and to boost our career opportunities via networking, this makes actually a great transition to our final presentation in this Women in GI webinar. And it is my pleasure to welcome Professor Jeffrey Mess from the University of Melbourne, Australia, to share his perspective as our male ally. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Georgiana. And first, I'd like to thank the organisers of this very important series for asking me to join the fourth webinar on the role of male ally, uh, an invitation which I enthusiastically accepted. The first slide shows uh, the definition, and I found the definition of the word ally important. An ally can be defined as a person providing assistance and support in an ongoing activity or struggle, or can be defined as one giving support to a marginalised or mistreated group. Now, it's true that women individually and collectively have been mistreated in the workplace, and this mistreatment is only very slowly being appropriately addressed and corrected. The definition may suggest conflict is required to redress the imbalance, but I believe a reasoned discussion and education and collaboration with firm support from male colleagues is a much better way forward. Conflict should not be necessary. The next slide, please. There can appear to be a fine line between aggressive and being assertive. There is clearly the need to have one's opinion heard, putting that opinion firmly, but also politely, being seen as assertive and constructive, but not bitter or aggressive, being seen as an equal contributor is preferable and more likely, I think, to be successful in the discussion. True male leaders will, uh, in any discussion, demand that the female voice is heard and will treat the female as an equal partner. The next slide, please. We heard in a previous talk, a webinar, and also it was touched on earlier today, in this series about the imposter syndrome, a syndrome where a person pretends to be someone else in order to deceive, or in this context, trainees or junior consultant colleagues who feel they're not up to the task, they're not capable, 
or perhaps they're in a situation where they feel opinions don't matter or they're not worthy of being expressed. Female colleagues are more likely to suffer this syndrome than their male counterparts. Now we know from statistics collected worldwide that girls in high school get better grades on average than the boys, that high school graduates need marks in the top two or three percent of points overall to get into medical school. And once in medical school, females as students get better marks on average than their male counterparts. As Dean of our medical school over many years, I've delivered the first lectures during the first week of our new medical student uh, intake. And I remind the students of these three points. Now, I believe that by emphasizing these facts, A, the students are intelligent. They wouldn't be in medical school unless they were. They wouldn't be in training positions in the hospital unless they were intelligent. And they wouldn't go into consultant work unless they're intelligent and capable. And by emphasizing those points early on in their development, I think that the female student particularly will grow in confidence and therefore less likely to suffer from imposter syndrome uh, as they embark on their career. Now, by advising them of these facts, it's not asking them to be arrogant. I found that by giving reassurance and confidence, we don't encounter the imposter syndrome, but certainly in our institution. The fourth slide, please. 15 years ago, when I was president of the Royal Australasian College of Physicians in Australia and New Zealand, I was concerned that I had a large number of women who wished to go undergo specialist training in our college, but because all training posts at that time were full-time, they felt unable to apply because of their inability to undertake a full-time training position plus deal with their family responsibilities. Because hospital training positions were linked to national and state work contracts, I had to go to government employment departments to request that they rewrite their contract so that the two trainees could share one full-time job. Government agreement enabled us to create just a couple of shared training positions initially, but when it was seen quite quickly that two women sharing one full-time training position were doing very effectively, very successfully, the program has expanded enormously over the years. Most of the jobs that are shared are two females, but then more recently, many men have taken on greater responsibility assisting with their family duties and bringing up the children. And so we have now many jobs with half-time position of female, half-time male. And also, occasionally, we see two males sharing a full-time post. Thank you again for inviting me, and I'd be very happy to take any questions. Thank you, Professor Matz, uh, both for the presentation, for being such a reliable male ally and also for pointing out the importance of being firm and constructive. Uh, I also found it very useful that you mentioned about the imposter syndrome and uh, why it's essential to minimize it and how we could achieve it. But in some places we might be facing another situation. You mentioned that in, you have the ability to prevent people from developing the imposter syndrome. How do we manage a situation in which people have already developed imposter syndrome? How do we fight this? I, I guess really it's nurturing, it's helping, it's networking, it's bringing in people to assist. I mean, uh, it's not you know, true that everyone can be free of imposter syndrome just by telling them they're very good. Um, we have to at the same time encourage them and support them. Support's terribly important all the way through our careers. Um, we all get anxious at times. We all feel at times that we don't know the answers. Um, not every doctor knows the answer to every problem. That's true. So it's a matter of supporting each other, encouraging each other. And when we see someone who's looking apprehensive, looking a bit anxious, to take them aside and encourage them, tell them, well, actually, you're doing a great job. You're fulfilling all your tasks. Your patients love you. Uh, we all think you're terrific. Uh, all of that uh, aspect helps to gain confidence and then people can get back on track. But support is important. It's not just 
allowing people to sail solo because we all need support at times. Yeah, you mentioned the importance of uh, being confident and to encourage people to be confident. However, there is a very fine line between exhibiting the self-confidence and going towards arrogance. How can one find balance in this situation? Yeah, sometimes it's a fine line, I, I, I agree. Um, I, I emphasize to people who look as if they're becoming uh, a bit on the arrogant side, I encourage them to recognize that they are there because they want to be good doctors. And patients don't like arrogant doctors. When you go in to look after your patient, the patient wants you to be gentle, helpful, nurturing for them. And the arrogant doctor hasn't got that capability. So when I see arrogant uh, trainees, I take them aside and I say, look, I know we all have different personalities. We all be been brought up differently by our families but please don't take this attitude because your patients won't like it your colleagues won't like it either it's very interesting you know traditionally we always say well certain groups are more arrogant the orthopedic surgeon traditionally is supposed to be arrogant um and and uh, so again i mean in medical school where we look after not just gastroenterology trainees we look after the whole spectrum of special specialization um, it's important to watch them as they're coming through and to guard against arrogant behaviour. And I think the, the thing that does correct people more than anything is when you tell them that patients don't like them when they're arrogant. Quite often people go into a discussion thinking, the patient will love me if I say I'm the best. You've come to the best doctor, therefore that's me. Pa patients don't like that, but they need to be reminded of that. Great. We have such uh, useful tips uh, from our male ally today, but I would like to ask our uh, lady panelists, how do you identify a reliable male ally? Dr. Um, Nancy. Thank you, Professor Jaffrey, for the wonderful talk and sharing your experiences and knowledge with us. Uh, I think diversity is the main key. Um, in practice, in medicine, we need our good male ally, our, our good male mentors. It's very important for our development, our, our good uh, male colleagues, male doctors, male residents. It's very important. A healthy relationship between male and female at the workplace is very important and diversity is the key. It's for the growth, it's for the knowledge, it's for the experience and for everything. It's very important. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think you can find them within your institution. Um, you can find them elsewhere. I've often, it's people you've met at meetings um, or people you, who've trained you in the past and you've moved elsewhere. And if you just stay in touch, they're often a good uh, source of advice. Um, other people you meet at, 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 you know, at different parts of the world, they can help you with, with various different things and, and, it's always good to have them and, and, and just to have an open mind. Um, and I, I agree, it's not we're better or they're better. It's it's all together because you never want to be that woman who gets the job and people say, oh, it's because she's a woman, she got it. She doesn't deserve to, to be there. And it's important to really work hard where you are and you'll get that, you'll you'll get those, those allies and uh, the, you know, now we all have Dr. Metz as our, our ally, and it's just from meeting him through meetings and webinars and this webinar. And so we can always go to him with any questions and, and I'm sure he'll help us out. <laughs> well, yes, I'd be delighted anytime. <laughs> I think it's interesting though, uh, in discussion, uh, I from time to time ask the question, are there differences between the genders? And clearly there are, I can't have a baby. Um, but the other, there are other differences. And uh, my wife, who's a, a specialist radiologist, uh, has been for many years. Um, she's a fantastic radiologist. Um, she's the one I, I refer to most often when I have a difficult uh, CT or MR. And throughout her career, although she's very, 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 very smart, 
uh, she was never wanting to get a pay rise. She thought, oh, well, I'll just take it as, a, as it comes. You know, she's in the public system. The public hospitals in Australia are not well paid. Um, and so I had to encourage her to say, look, you are worth it. For heaven's sake, you're worth it. It's, I uh, think, what is it? There's a, a L'Oreal advertisement which just says, because you're worth it. And um, it's true. People have to have that confidence to know that they're, that they're worth it. And uh, so even my wife, who's, you know, uh, we've been together a very, very long time. I, I can't say how long. Um, we had our anniversary yesterday. But the, uh, I think it is a gender difference. And so we do have to encourage our female trainees, our female young consultants to go for the job as, as was mentioned earlier. Um, it, it's, it's so important, but as Reem said, you, you can't just sit there and expect that they'll throw the money at you or throw the new job at you. You've got to go for it. Finding a balance between uh, the degree of self-confidence, self-worth and empathy and understanding others' perspective is uh, challenging, but in the same time, it's key to to going forward. And of course, working together and supporting each other is essential, mm. uh, which I think we've really had part today. And thank you all for joining us today. I also hope that this uh, powerful messages sent by the amazing panelists we had uh, in this meeting will be useful for you. And this leads us to the final points of this webinar. Uh, since we are all wanderers in this world, it is what we do that matters. And uh, please don't forget that each time a woman stands for herself, she stands up for all women. And it's also my pleasure to share this nice memory from the Women in GI uh, meeting in, at the World Congress of Gastroenterology in Dubai, with women uh, standing up for each other together with their male allies. Uh, thank you, Millie. Uh, thank you, Maria, and uh, the entire WGO team for making this webinar possible and accessible to everyone. Also, a recording of this webinar will be available on the WGO website and also on the YouTube channel. Um, last but not least, please complete the brief survey following the webinar so that you let us know of your opinion of uh, how the format can be improved so that it can be more supportive and also accessible for uh, for everyone. Thank you all for participating today. It was a great pleasure to be among you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.